Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jim Al-Khalili. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Surrey, uh, and I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society. So thank you all for joining us for this. This is the penultimate um, in the Royal Society's year-long series, You and AI. Uh, so yes, penultimate uh, um, event in this year-long series of, uh, of, uh, of events we've been holding around the country, You and AI, which has been exploring the world of artificial intelligence and opening up the conversation with leading experts on how AI is going to affect all of our daily lives in the coming years. Now, the Royal Society has played a part in some of the most fundamental, historical, life-changing discoveries in science for over 350 years. And the Society's fellowship of esteemed researchers continue to make outstanding contributions to science in many important and diverse research areas. Now, in April of last year, April 2017, the Royal Society launched its landmark report on machine learning, based on extensive research into public views on AI and engagement with industry and with policymakers. This called for action in a number of key areas over the, over the next five years, over the next 10 years, um, to support safe and rapid development of machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies. It also called for an informed public debate, essentially why we're all here this evening, about the development of machine learning and how its benefits can be distributed across society. So the You and AI series aims to help develop this public conversation about what machine learning and AI are, how these technologies work, and the ways in which they may and indeed will affect all of our lives. From healthcare and transport to scientific research itself, it's clear that there's a wealth of potential benefits to be gained from the effective use of AI. But there are concerns as well, and I'm sure many of you have them, and I hope we will explore some of those this evening about how these technologies might develop, how they're going to be used, who's going to use them, who's going to control them, how might AI affect the job market, how can we create trustworthy AI systems? How, when, would we be happy, or indeed unhappy, about an AI system making a major decision by itself? For example, when a prisoner might be released on parole, or uh, what medical treatment to prescribe to a patient. This is coming. AI will be able to make those decisions without human intervention. How do we feel about that? If we want to bring the benefits, uh, bring about the benefits that AI can deliver both safely and rapidly, then we need a broad and well-informed public. We need well-informed public debate about how AI technologies might affect us and how we as a society want to use them or indeed not use them. It's, we hope it would be up to us in a democracy. Part of this is having a forum to ask questions and debate the answers, which is why we're all here this evening. With me this evening are some of the UK's leading thinkers on AI, and together we'll be discussing AI's capabilities and frontiers, the ethics behind the technology and the potential impact on jobs, as well as the implications for society as a whole. We're also joined by these 30 small guests. They're already here on stage with me. I think they're already on. But there's various flashing lights. There's the odd one fidgeting here and there, which is sort of a bit disconcerting. And I also want to make sure I don't walk backwards and squash one of them, because apparently they're quite expensive. We're going to hear about them a little bit more uh, later on. Um, and of course, we've been asking you for your burning questions on artificial intelligence which I now have and I will pose to our panel of experts. Before I formally introduce the panel, I would, of course, like to take this opportunity to say how delighted we are to be here, this fantastic venue, the Royal Exchange Theatre. Also, we'd like to, to thank 
the Manchester Science Festival program. This event is part of the Manchester Science Festival program, and in particular, we'd like to thank DeepMind, uh, the company who've kindly supported the whole U and AI series. Right then, so without further ado, let's meet our panel. Thank you. Right, so some brief introductions. First of all, Dame Wendy Hall, Regis Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton, Executive Director of the Web Science Institute and a Fellow of the Royal Society. Professor Neil Lawrence, Chair in Neuro and Computer Science at the University of Sheffield, Machine Learning Researcher at Amazon and a member of the Royal Society's Machine Learning Working Group and Dr. Eva Luger, Chancellor's Fellow in Digital Arts and Humanities, studying AI ethics at the University of Edinburgh. Another round of applause, please. For <laughs> so, I want to start with a, a sort of a, a generic question to, to sort of get the ball rolling, which, that I want to ask uh, all of you, and it's, what does AI mean to you? Come to you, Eva, first. Okay, um, so AI, I suppose if we think of authentic intelligence as being human intelligence, then um, artificial intelligence would be uh, the intelligence exhibited by machines. So um, machines that um, adapt, learn, reason, that kind of thing. Wendy? Hard work. <laughs> <laughs> I um, co-wrote, last year, 2017, I co-wrote a review on AI for the UK government to do with um, how we use AI to help grow the economy, create jobs, and since then the phone hasn't stopped ringing, or maybe more the emails haven't stopped uh, coming in, and the invites, uh, because we're in this hype curve at the moment of AI, and I'm gonna, we're gonna tease that out during the panel. Um, <coughs> but it, it's, uh, it's how we manage the people's expectations during this period of hype about AI. Neil. So I liked Ava's answer. Uh, separating the difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. I, I don't necessarily know what it means to me anymore because everyone tells me it means so many different things. But maybe to define intelligence, um, for me, what intelligence means is that you use information to um, reduce your resource consumption. So uh, I can do something in a more efficient way if someone gives me information. I know that's not human intelligence, but in terms of what we're trying to do with AI, I think that's very often what we're trying to do. So you have a goal, and you're trying to do it more efficiently by using information. I mean, in a sense, this is really, I guess, a continuation of the Industrial Revolution. We've always used machines to do jobs more efficiently, more quickly, more intelligently than us. But now, I suppose, it's, it's not the mechanics that we're making use of, it's the, it's the software, it's the, it's the information. Um, now, for, I guess for a lot of people, when you, you think about AI, I mean, we're sort of all infected by Hollywood movies. Uh, and so uh, it's often thought of in, in terms of futuristic sci-fi terms. So what is AI doing for us right now? So I think there's an amazing spectrum. Uh, at one, in one part, to reference what Wendy was saying about the hype, AI is just extreme statistics. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of parallels between machine learning, which I've worked in, and statistics. It's just the emphasis of what we're looking at was slightly different. So, um, I mean, it's, it's doing things around uh, our mobile phones, intelligent agents, you know, recognition of people. The first thing from, that came out of my community was that little box around your head when you, you take a photo of someone that identified where the face was. We were shocked. Wow, we've done someone when someone's implemented. But today, it's everywhere. Um, whether you know it or not. Um, my favorite application that I've worked on is, was actually in um, uh, Africa, trying to better understand the distribution of disease. It was very simple uh, systems, but it was allowing um, us to uh, inform the Ministry of Health in Uganda about where to target drug transport. So there you see, use the information, use your resource more efficiently by putting the drugs where needed in the right place. And, and we're gonna see this happening more and more. I mean, Wendy, you said this, We've, we seem to be talking a lot about AI at the moment, and that's because the technology over the last even year or two is moving so rapidly. Well, it isn't just the technology. It's the fact that there's a lot of data. 
That's the big uh, impetus behind this AI revolution. There have been four AI waves, probably, and there's a, usually a winter in between each of them. A AI started 50 years ago or more in the, in the 1950s. People started talking about um, could machines think. And since then, we've had waves of development, and, and the uh, impact of research is often 20 years after the research is done in universities. So what we're seeing today is the impact of research that was done maybe 50, 10, 15 years ago, but we have very fast computers and we have a lot of data on which to train the algorithms. And I think that's the major impetus behind what we're doing today. But there's a lot of um, expert systems work in many industries, and expert systems were developed in the 60s and 70s. So... Um, that, you know, we're seeing the impact of what's sometimes called good old-fashioned AI. We're seeing breakthroughs with machine learning, deep learning, which are, again, based on research that was done 15 or more years ago. But the difference is we've got a very fast computers and a lot of data, and I think we're going to talk more about mm. the use of data. On the and the part of that is just increased computing capacity and memory and, and mm. the fact that we've got somewhere to store all this data. Yes, yes. And, of course, with all this data ever comes the issue of, of the ethics of, mm -hmm. you know, who controls it, whose data, you know, if, like, you know health data. If one, one day, presumably, we're going to have our genomes all mapped and we're going to personalise medicine. So, so where, where are we heading with AI on maybe on the ethics side today? Well, um, I mean, ethics is something that's getting a huge amount of attention at the moment. You know, um, everybody's super interested in it. Um, uh, most university departments will be now hiring people around ethics. Industrial labs are hiring ethicists. Um, so there's a lot of thought going into this, but um, I, I suppose my, my, my primary concern is that there tends to be, at the moment, a sort of a, a push towards the idea that there's one ethics for everybody. Mm. So if we understand ethics as the rules that govern our moral conduct, morality being what we consider to be right or wrong, then um, we can sort of sense immediately that that's, there's not just one. You know, if I live in um, China, my sort of ethical reasoning will be different from if I live in the UK. So trying to find one set of rules that we all adhere to is going to be incredibly problematic. So um, one would hope that uh, artificial intelligence could be adjust its moral reasoning in accordance, but we're, we're actually, you know, we're nowhere near that. So th these are sort of the challenges that will come up. And uh, how about things like reg putting regulations in place, you know, about, you know, who, who controls the data, you know, even you know, sort of as, as a, almost as a separate issue from the ethics. Yeah. The, the rules about what you can and can't do, the rules about, you know, transparency and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And regulation is really important. And we're seeing um, people being enormously concerned about this. The EU general data protection regulation that came into effect in May um, this year has sort of started to talk about algorithms, including, I mean, it's, it's a bit contested in terms of what it means, but the notion of a right to explanation, that if you feel that um, uh, uh, an algorithm has made a judgment about you that you're unhappy about or that causes harm, you're mm. able to push back against that. Um, so, so we are thinking about this. I mean, the the importance of governance, of ensuring that the data is managed appropriately, that it's not shared inappropriately, that we think about harm um, right at the sort of the start of system design is incredibly important. And I think regulation does play a role, but we, as, as you quite rightly pointed out, we do need to have a sort of a, a separation between what we understand to be the law, which should be the basement, that's the least we should do, to what um, e ethics are, what we should morally do, and that should be what we're aspiring to. So, um, you know, th that's the kind of distinction mm -hmm. that I see there. Right, so I would now start on the questions that have been sent in uh, by the audience. Uh, and so, the first one comes from Jack, who asks, which sectors or industries do you see as benefiting most from AI and machine learning? And if you were to draw a timeline, how far along it are we in terms of uptake? Neil? Um, it's a great question and probably goes to the crux of the issue. Um, my feeling is it's a bit like asking what sectors are going to benefit from the telephone or the mobile phone, the computer or the internet. Uh, it's a very pervasive technology, um, and it's difficult to predict because humans are so imaginative in terms of what they can do with technology. But I would broadly say that there's two things that we'll see happening, because just, I'm just copying what happened in the past. There'll be new businesses we just can't even imagine or can't even think of, like who would have thought of social networking in 1994, you know, and, 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 and internet mm -hmm. search, but these are the largest companies in the world. 
Um, but I think things get really interesting when they change the existing businesses, things that will always be here, like transport and health and logistics. And that's much, much harder, because those systems have evolved into something that makes use of humans as an integral part of the loop. It's not easy to just take them out and put in automated agents. And there are many, many issues. And my feeling is you'll see two things. You'll see things happen very quickly in terms of new innovation and all the imagination of all the wonderful entrepreneurs we have. And then things will happen much slower than people expect in those sort of more traditional sectors like transport and, and health. And, you know, for me, health is one I'm really interested in, but um, everywhere, but at different speeds and perhaps and sometimes not as fast as people think. I mean, we've, we've, it's happened time and again with, with technologies that replace Humans, and we, we went through sort of the, you know with the silicon chip in the in the seventies, and, and certainly it did replace jobs, you know, on on, on uh, factory floors, production lines, for example, automation. We're now talking again about robotics automation with with AI coming in, but I get the sense that what's different now is we simply don't know how many jobs are going to be affected, or you know what new jobs might. I mean, we've never known what new jobs in advance might be created with the new technology that. We, can't even dream of at the moment. But we, we don't seem to know the extent of how far it'll push humans off, off, the, off, the, off the job market. I, I think that, um, I mean, we're sitting in the Corn Exchange in Manchester, surrounded by buildings that were industrial looms and are now flats, where I'm a professor in Sheffield, the effect on the steel industry, you know, the devastation actually the North suffered as a result of the changing nature of work. Um, I'm not actually sure, I don't think anything like that scale, or even the industrialization as people move from the land. What I do think is really, really difficult to replace is human contact. And what I hope happens is, you know, I quite like hipster coffee bars and all this sort of thing where people are doing <laughs> things. Just, you know, computers can't do that. You, you imagine walking into a hipster coffee bar and having the computer say, this is single origin prepared by a computer in Guatemala. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> My hope is that, that the world around us will allow us to do more of the things we feel as humans. What we've seen in the past is we've had to adapt to the computer, not the computer, but the form of automation. We have to get up when someone, we have to come into work and put a punch our time clock. We have to do everything to make the, the machines more efficient. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if this revolution was centered around us and centered around what's nice for us rather than uh, what's nice for the machine as the previous revolution? So that's my mm. sort of optimistic hope. Mm. Do you agree, Wendy? Uh, yes and no, of course, very academic answer. The example I always give, um, and I've heard other people give it, is my father was an accountant. Well, actually, he was a bookkeeper. And by the time he retired in the uh, late 70s, he was just moving on to using calculators. Other, he'd done everything by hand up until that time. Huge columns of numbers, yeah. long division of, of uh, pounds, shillings, and pence, all done by hand. And that, you know, copying ledgers... Uh, all those jobs have gone. Everything's gone. It's been completely automated, and the banks have disappeared off the high street. Mm -hmm. But the finance industry is bigger than it ever before. Um, and this is because of the creativity of human beings, mm -hmm. because when the machines can take the repetitive jobs, that then we can use our creativity to think about new ideas. And this comes back to your idea of, uh, someone said, to Democratization of knowledge, or was it something you said earlier? Um, and uh, you know, getting new knowledge as well. But I is, aren't AI starting to do that? There yes, are algorithms absolutely. that are showing intuition, absolutely. creativity. Yes, and this is happening in health, for example, um, creating new, creation of new drugs, uh, potentially using AI, using AI to diagnose cancer earlier. But I do agree with Neil that. Um, uh, human contact is important. I, I think coffee bars, as we know them, will disappear. Um, uh, mm. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> maybe. But I, I, I d the one, the, the thing I, um, the Japanese have put a bet on robots helping the elderly, right? Uh, they have a, a much bigger problem than us. We have the same one, but they have a much bigger problem of too many old folk that need look caring for. And I worry that uh, we, I don't think we can use robots to care for old everything that, uh, that people's needs mm. are. 
and I think human contact is very important. We're miles away from general AI. Um, you know, the robots do what they're programmed to do at the moment. They, they can't think outside the box. They can't be, they don't have understanding. They don't have empathy. Mm. They only know what we tell them. Uh, you know, we need another whole uh, wave of research development to be able to develop general AI robots that care and empathize. And uh, by that point, we need to have the ethics of the morality sorted yeah. out. I do think, though, I will, something that um, I have a lot of, I think we can use this revolution to think about at, at the social contract. Um, I mean, we take for granted the fact that, on the whole, we have a five-day week and a weekend. Well, this revolution could lead us to a four-day week. And I'm not saying this as a, you know, on a political stance. I'm just saying it could. Mm -hmm. We could, we could, uh, and then, and we could spend more time, therefore, with our families. And we could use it in that way if we're clever. But we've seen industrialization doing that for us anyway. It has, you know, yes. Try, you know, go yes, 1950s the I housewife and say, well, you can't have this washing machine anymore. Mm. You have to spend the day doing the washing. Exactly. I mean, it's opened I mean, up. And we take the weekend for granted. Our Victorian grandparents oh, didn't. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, kids yeah. worked for seven days a week in those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, the society has changed dramatically alongside mm. the, the machine revolution. Right. I'm, as I'm listening to you, I've got one eye on these little monkeys and, the, and some of them are sort of stretching out to the to the periphery of their little den so it's probably a good time maybe to uh, give them center stage literally so um, here to demonstrate one of the technological applications making use of machine learning in AI uh, and we're going to welcome him onto the, onto the stage is Daniel Carillo Zapata from Prof uh, Professor Sabine Howitt's lab at the University of Bristol Daniel. I would like to start with a question. Have you ever wondered how ants are so good at finding your picnic table? <laughs> uh, they even create the shortest trail between your foot and their nest. They go like tick, 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 tick. That's an example of swarm intelligence where thousands of individuals um, with really simple rules and reacting only to their local um, environment and neighbors can self-organize to perform really beautiful, complex behaviors. And they do that without any leader telling them what to do, not even the Queen Ant. <laughs> My field, Swarm Robotics, takes inspiration from swarms in nature. And here I've got some running robots uh, that I would like to, to show you. Uh, this is a kilobot. We work with these uh, little cute robots at the Bristol Robotics Lab. And I brought 60 today. But you know what? We've got a 1,000 in the lab. Uh, so they are quite simple. They've got two vibrating motors, so they can move, as you see. They've got an LED, so they can signal e their in internal state. Uh, they've got an ambient light sensor, so they can sense where, where they are in their local um, environment. They've got the computing power of a scientific calculator, so not too much. Uh, and most importantly, they can communicate to neighbors within 10 centimeters. And here, I've got a demo that I will show you. I'm going to upload a decision-making program inspired on how bees do decision-making. <laughs> I'm sure they won't. They're really simple. You're safe. <laughs> so, did you know there's democracy in bees? Actually, in house hunting bees. I'm going to show you an algorithm, a program, inspired by that decision making in democracies. So, I use this controller to send commands 
to the robots, but I'm not telling them what to do or what they're going to do. I'm just sending their code inside so they can run it. What you will see is that some robots will flash blue and others will flash red. In this case, blue represents a really good option, whereas red isn't as good, okay? So, if I can have the lights a bit, a bit down for you to see. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to run it. Okay, you ready? Let's see what happens. I don't know if you can see, but they all became blue, even though some of them didn't respond to the command. <laughs> so they all decided blue, but how? Well, they've got a really simple program with two rules. One, pick up the option from a neighbor at random, completely at random, and communicate that option for a length of time proportional to the quality of that option. So robots uh, in blue will communicate blue for longer. The rest, they will be more likely to pick up blue from their neighbors and so that they all eventually become blue. But the most beautiful thing is that this one doesn't know what that one over there is deciding. But in the end, they all share the same decision. So in summary, swarm intelligence is about getting an emergent global behavior out of local information and no leaders. And that's my field. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. And so we return to your questions. So, and I think this next one follows on nicely from our robotics demo. Uh, we have Becky, who sounds quite alarmed. How do we stop machines enslaving us? I mean, in, in fact, there were a lot of questions on the <laughs> threats that AI uh, might pose. So what are the greatest risks of AI? Neil, can I come to you first? So uh, I was thinking during the demo, um, this separation between, you actually have a swarm intelligence inside you, um, and you're not very aware of it until you have a runny nose, and that's your immune system. It's constantly trying to detect threats, attacks. Um, why doesn't it use your brain? Well, there is, a, we, there is probably some connection we don't understand, but just imagine, you say, I found a virus in 62C, shall I destroy it? And then, oh, I'm talking to Jim, I can't mm -hmm. answer. Um, the sense we all have of AI is of this centralized thing that's going to dominate. But I think that in that sense, what we're actually getting will be more like a distributed intelligence. Um, I don't, the, it, it, machines have enslaved us. We are enslaved to machines already. <laughs> I was up here, coming on the train up here, and everyone was enslaved by their machine. It, they were entertaining them, all sorts of things. Um, I, I think that the, the point is, the be most beautiful thing about AI and this goes to sort of Eva's comment earlier, that we all have different values. And this sense of a unified value is, is just absurd. You know, I hope that we learn more and more about ourselves as we try and create solutions um, to help us. Um, and when we get a deeper understanding of who we are, we'll be able to adjust the solutions we use to sort of remove the enslavement that we have today of those machines. Um, but, you know, we're not... I, I just think there's no... The idea of a large AI that's going to create itself and do things is, I mean, uh, I think that we're, you know, the problems we face are the practical problems of the computer makes me do this, computer says no. I thought that, you know. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And, and we want to stop that. You know, that's such a funny thing because it's what happens. The computer says no, so you can't do it, right? And we need to get around that and get the computer to be more attuned to us than we are to the computer. Because the computer's too stupid. At, computers at, at are super point. stupid. Yeah. They have no idea of context yeah. or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, they're shockingly stupid. They don't understand us. Um, and so they constantly do th stupid things. Um, now, one hope is that maybe that we could get computers to better understand us and, and what we want. Um, yeah. Eva, what, what would you say are the, the, the threats? Not, not being enslaved by Terminator or Skynet or whatever. Maybe, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I think the, sort of the science fiction narratives are really exciting, aren't they? You know, we all know mm. them and you know, robots are going to take over the Earth. But I mean, as um, we just heard, it's unlikely, really. We're not, we're not at that stage. And also for um, uh, an AI to be able to engage in the kind of activity that results in enslaving, it would have to be smarter than, I mean, when we think about intelligence, we think about it largely in two different ways. So there's uh, sentience, which is like how sharp and smart is it, you know, and, and computers are really good at that. And sapience, and sapience is more like our ability to experience what we call phenomenological things, so things like empathy, sadness, um, and we don't have computers that can do that. But if you think about any um, you know, uh, relationship that would result in one person being subservient to another, it would require both types of intelligence. So um, there's that. And, and the other thing is that rather than enslaving, I think we should be more worried about manipulation. So um, a lot of the systems that we currently engage with, um, whether they're sort of social media systems or whether it is you know, um, applications on your phone that are unrelated to social media, they're designed to be sticky. They're designed to make us return, to make us exhibit types of behaviors. Um, we saw from the Facebook emotional like, contagion experiment that actually, um, uh, which was where they, they, they ran a, a sort of a, an experiment uh, whereby some posts were positive and some posts were negative, and they wanted to see how far that, that traveled, whether people, you know, whether it was contagious. Um, and we know that, uh, that this is true, that, that basically, uh, you know, we can manipulate each other through these kinds of systems into doing things that otherwise we might not have done. So I think... Um, Speaking t to the earlier point, we are being, well, maybe not enslaved, perhaps, but, but certainly manipulated and managed, um, which is why governance and ethics are so important, because uh, it, there's a lot of money to be made in managing us and our emotions and behaviours. But I mean, well, so we get, I get the sense of we say enslaved by our, our smartphones, for example. We sort of have a sense of, you know, well, I may be addicted to it in the sense that I find it fun, but I'm controlling it, I'm switching it on, you know, mm -hmm. it may be feeding me, you know, it's not feeding me what it wants me to hear, it's feeding me what, what I want to hear because it's too dumb. And a, and a lot of AI experts get frustrated by this constant yes, but, you know, when machines take over the world. Mm -hmm. In principle, presumably, mm -hmm. you know, this is what, some, something Wendy touched, touched on, in principle, artificial general intelligence, when a machine can ultimately become sentient, there's no sort of technological thing that is stopping that from happening ever, even if it's not in the 21st century? Or, or, or are AI experts still arguing about whether that would ever be possible? Well, I think... It doesn't um, have to be human, in, in, but, you know, but it, exhibiting the higher level states that like human emotions. For a lot of the people that work in the AI sector that, that I, I work with, the goal is you know, AGI, artificial general right. intelligence. So, but um, <laughs> the, the way that they we're getting there is through tiny incremental projects that are, have really clear parameters around them. So, um, you know, the, the examples of a, an AI that beat a human at Go or, mm. you know, at chess, those, those are really clear parameters. You know, I if you broaden out those parameters, then, then it would fail. So um, I think w we're so far away, away from, from that yeah, point yeah. that um, it's sort of it's, it's difficult to imagine and also it comes back to the notion of you know if we're designing these systems now we have a certain level of control as to what those systems will or will not be allowed to do and the fact that we're having these um, global discussions uh, about what what ethics ought to guide the mm. systems that we design I think is an, is an important one um, I mean, I know in Germany where they're, um, you know, focusing on driverless cars, one of the things is, you know, you should protect preservation of human life is a rule that, that, that they think should be hardwired into pretty much all of those systems. But then when you start thinking about that in, in more detail, what does that actually mean? 
there's a project, um, MIT, the Moral Machine. Uh, if, if anybody's been online with that, basically it's like a quiz, and you can, they give you a series of um, sort of thought experiments where you're driving this car, do you kill this person or this mm. person or this person, and the, and the parameters change, and then you can see how people across the world voted. So we get a sense of how diverse our morality is, but in reality, it also makes you realize how hard that would be to program into something, like who do you kill over whom? And yeah. even that question is ridiculous, really, but it's an interesting idea. It was discussed in depth in The Good Place on Netflix, if yeah. anyone watches that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, okay. Jeanette would like to know, what do you think are the gravest political challenges the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning will pose to human society? I guess this is for you, Wendy. Well, the immediate answer is probably job loss versus job creation and what that imposes to society. Um, but I think that um, there's also the issue of, well, there's the ethics and morality issues which we have to worry about. I want to just make the point that Stephen Hawking said not long before he died that if we could have machines that are more intelligent than us, then that's the end of the human race. Because if machines can evolve themselves to do tasks, um, which some computer science, including DeepMind, the company that's funding this um, event, that's their stated goal mm. on their website. If they can, then out machines will out-evolve us because we're biological and that takes actually longer to evolve than machines. And so um, it's a, I think it's a philosophical question about how far we can get there. But I, I do think we have to, because we are pretty safe at the moment, we are in control mostly at the moment, although the companies that use AI with the social networks do play the psychological game to get us to use their stuff more. Um, we have to be thinking about the future, and that's what we need our politicians to help us do, and that has to be done at a global level. Um, and um, Eva made the point about um, the, the culture that you come from very much determines your ethical or moral um, views, and I spend a lot of time in China. Now, China has billions of people on the internet behind a, you know, the, the, the bamboo firewall, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, uh, and they have a very different view to this than we do, um, and the government has access to all the data, and they have face recognition on their CCTV, and um, it's, uh, we, we're, yeah, we're approaching the time when um, in January, they estimate 50% of the world will be on the internet. Well, that's awesome in two ways. One, that in 30 years, we've got 50% of the world on the internet, but there's 50% still to go. Mm. And most of those are in rural China, rural India, and rural Africa. And you think about, well, who's going to be managing the internet in the future? And that's where all the data is, and that's where all this manipulation is going to happen. So our politicians have really got to think on a geopolitical level about this, as well as, well as on the social level about managing through the peaks and troughs of the job losses and job creation. And, um, you know, and the, so there's all the issues that we brought up in the review we did about how we get existing industry to adopt AI, how we help the startups, how we in reduce the skills gap so we get more and more people able to work in this industry. But I really think they, they have to think on the global and scale as well, which is really difficult at the moment. I mean, the debates are happening. You know, people are, you know... You hear the, the government reports, a big House of Lords report as well, you know, on, on AI and, and, mm, and affecting very jobs. Very good one. The, the, so you sort of get the feeling that the policymakers and politicians are talking about it and are, are starting to be aware how quickly the, t the, the technology well, is advancing. Yes, I think uh, I have a theory about that, which is that um, uh, as well as, you know, the, the, the AI, this AI revolution is driven by computer processing power and, and the data that's available, which has largely been driven by the availability of the internet. Um, but also, all the politicians go every year to Davos. And in January 2017, Schwaber, who, Klaus Schwaber, who runs Davos, released a book called The Fourth, Fourth Industrial, the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And that was all about you know, how are you going to deal with AI? And they all came away from Davos thinking, we've got to do something about this. So there are every country in the, uh, oh, I don't know about, yes, even China, uh, you know, all the developed world is having an AI, AI strategies, how are we going to deal with it, how we, and there's, there is effectively 
an arms, you know, there's an AI race and the superpowers are the US and China. And a country like the UK has to work out where it fits in. in we cannot be a superpower in AI, but we can be a balance of power in AI and we can do good things mm. and we can look after our economy. And, uh, and Europe, you picked up GDPR. Europe has gone very much for data protection and that sends good signals out. Um, so it's, <laughs> you know, mm. when... When Chinese companies tra like Alibaba trade here, then <laughs> if we buy and sell anything on Alibaba, then the Chinese mm -hmm. government have access to all that information. It's we can't afford to sort of ease off or step back from, from no. the, the debate of technology. We are one of the countries that lead the world. And I suppose we if we don't do it, someone else will. <laughs> we, we, we lead the world in terms of, well, we don't lead. I would say the US and rapidly China are coming up in terms of the number of AI researchers. But we have some amazing AI research in this country because it goes back the 50 odd mm. years. You, I mean, you, you can argue we invented it through uh, Alan Turing and the I whole concept of can machines think. And um, so, and we have a fantastic legacy and wonderful universities that teach and do research in AI. You've seen examples here um, from Bristol and you know, we all represent universities that are very good at AI. And so we can, we can still, um, uh, we, we are very inventive in this space. The, the hard thing is that the, even DeepMind, sorry DeepMind, um, you know, the business model of the AI startups at the moment is to be bought by Google or Facebook. Right, that's, that's your business model. I mean, Demis Hassibas of DeepMind says they had to sell to Google to get the data to develop the algorithms mm. as well as the money. And that's a big problem for Europe big problem and that comes back to how do we how do we tax these companies i mean <laughs> there are huge issues here and it moves faster than any chance of the exchequer can move but these companies have bigger turnover than the gdp of most countries so big issues uh okay next up we have josh who asks do you worry that AI will reflect the implicit biases of the designers? Mm. How can we address this? Ever? Yes. <laughs> yes, we and can, you it. think? Yes, um, we worry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we worry. Yeah, yes, well, a bit of both, and then I'll just stop talking. No. Um, yes, we, uh, we should worry, um, absolutely. Uh, and people are already thinking about this. So there's, um, there's a number of trends uh, at the moment within, um, I guess, industrial and academic thinking. One of them is the fairness, awareness, and transparency um, movement, which is abridged as FAT. So, um, and uh, also the responsible research and innovation um, movement, which is thinking about um, sort of ethics and responsibility right from the get-go. Um, but uh, in terms of bias specifically, there are sort of two ways that we might think about that. One is that um, algorithms are designed by humans who are inherently biased, and therefore potentially some bias could bleed into the way that we design those systems. But the more pressing concern in the one that um, I guess we can illustrate to ourselves if we ever Google anything, is that there is unconscious or implicit bias um, mm. in the data that these models um, that uh, sort of run the systems are trained on. So um, for example, if you Google doctor, um, and I'm not, I'm not picking on Google particularly, it's just the most obvious search engine, and bing it, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, so like, uh, no B does. Um, but if you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, well, Microsoft. What Google Doctor? <laughs> <Come on. Yeah. laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, if you Google Doctor, predominantly the images that you'll see will be men, mm -hmm. and most of the faces will be white. So there's some unconscious and implicit bias that is in that data set that's, that's generating that output. Um, and also this is a particular concern for things like facial recognition, particularly if we're going to be using um, facial recognition in things like driverless cars, you know, if you have to recognize passengers out, uh, not passengers, sorry, um, pedestrians out on the street. Um, because predominantly most of the models are, are sort of um, trained on white faces. So you have a, a massive potential issue there because obviously people are disenfranchised through that model. So one way that we can deal with that potentially is by um, extending the, the data upon which the systems are um, trained. So m diversifying that and there are projects that are looking to do that. And the others are to train people that sort of design uh, so these systems, so AI specialists, um, interaction designers, interface designers, um, about unconscious bias and what it means and how to detect it. Um, I mean, you know, fundamentally, the systems that we're designing are just reflecting reflections of us as human beings. So, you know, we're all bad, and therefore the systems are bad. That's the only way of thinking about it, really. But the problem with artificial intelligence is that it has the op 
you know, it encodes it. It has the potential to encode these biases, and also um, the more that these biases uh, are embedded within systems that make judgments about us that might result in harm, the more problematic it is. So if you have a bias model running um, in a criminal justice system, potentially, or to decide whether you get insurance, or decide whether you get education, then that bias becomes problematic. Um, so uh, in answer to your question, yes, it's a big problem. Yes, we should be doing something. Yes, mm. we are, but no, we haven't solved it. <laughs> um, Wendy, I mean, usually we hear that the whole benefits of, of AI is that they can circumvent or somehow be more objective than humans who are so riddled with um, societal biases and, 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 and sort of subjectivity? In some instances, but uh, if you're training them on data that's been produced by humans, then they'll pick up it's all there. the bias that, that is there, and then you have to decide, do you program that bias out? And who has the right to program that bias out? And in what way? And... And so, yes, yeah, sometimes they can be more objective. And I often say, when you talk about automated cars, nobody asked me about my moral attitudes when <laughs> I took my driving test, yeah. right? Uh, you just have to make up your own mind who you yeah. kill. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody taught me yeah. that. <laughs> and, and we all know about the instinct we have to, you know, avoid a dog and kill a pedestrian because we've seen that animal and, that, you know, the highway code says kill the animal, but, you know, the instinct instinct is <gasps> and and so cars may well make the right decision in those circumstances as scary as it seems but i think i want to just move the conversation a little bit to the issue of diversity because mm. it's one we tackled mm -hmm. and thought about a lot when we were doing the review is that we have you know we have to address the skills gap we need more people working in this industry we need to open it up to as many people as possible you know if you're thinking of something to do you can write your own paycheck in this world so you know it really is a fantastic future for people and you, but you don't all have to be not everybody who works in ai has to be an extreme machine learning programmer um and it's very important that we have diverse teams that come from different disciplinary backgrounds we need the ethicists, we need humanities, we need the econ economists, we need the lawyers, we need the social scientists, we need the philosophers and psychologists involved in this world. And we need to create, I think, the, um, an essence of interdisciplinary teams uh, working on, uh, in, our co in companies that are developing AI algorithms, products, services, uh, to, to sort out these problems. So it, it's... Um, we don't have the answers, but I, my plea is for, to think about diversity everywhere. So, next question. I, I've realised I've got this. I'm going to ask the, the ladies again this one. I'll come to you for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Don't, I, don't, I haven't forgotten. Um, we need some you're diversity. Biased, yeah. You're biased. You're <laughs> biased. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this question comes from Gideon, who wants to know. With algorithms becoming commonplace in various industries, should we be putting greater emphasis on teaching mathematics, probability, stats, calculus, in school to better equip future generations for challenges that lie ahead? Um, well, I think generally, yes, anyway, you know, because we're moving into an environment within which these are going to be core skills. Um, but I think... Uh, sort of alongside that is maybe the, the, the softer idea of teaching computational thinking um, and teaching people enough about a system to be able to understand what it is they're interacting with. So, um, and I'm thinking as well, not just children, because actually when you think, I often think, you know, yes, we should be teaching children to do these things. I think that now, but those children become adults in 20 years and how useful was that information? So to some extent, I kind of think that we need to be focusing on adults as well. So mm -hmm. the post-16 mm -hmm. education sector, people who are interacting with these systems on a daily basis are just ignored and marginalized in this context. And actually, um, you know, we, uh, very many people don't understand how the models operate that run the systems, and um, why should they? But actually, if we put a little bit of focus on ensuring that all of society has equal access to the information and understanding so they can act interact with AI in a way that benefits them and doesn't harm them. I think that's super important. And the other um, sort of uh, part to that question is that um, we should be teaching um, co computer skills, but actually I've been doing some research with the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants for England and Wales, pitting up on your accountancy example. I was like, oh yes, that's what they said when you were talking. <laughs> um, but uh, 
what we're discovering there is that, um, yes, you know, the sort of the, the skills that could be automated are being automated. There's a sort of a, a triangle where you've got very uh, partners and senior managers at the top. The people at the bottom in terms of the job roles are sort of gradually being eradicated. And actually what's left in the middle is, you know, the, you've got to work out what skills these people need just to be able to enter the middle of an employment triangle. And one of the things is soft skills. So the fact that in accounting particularly, um, you still need to interact with clients. You still need to convince people that your systems are trustworthy. So actually, there's, uh, as well as those kinds of skills, we should be thinking more about the sort of the human skills that allow these technologies to embed it in social life and professional life. Mm. Mm. Did you have anything to add to that? When did well, you there's think so it? much here. Um, I, I, uh, first of all, the, the government um, recently, and when Michael Gove, um, uh, when he was education minister, changed the curriculum so that we dropped IT and everyone's doing computer science. And we all said, fantastic idea, but I knew what would happen. And what's happened is um, we've got less people now reading computer, doing computer science A-levels than we had before. And partly it's a problem, and less girls particularly, um, because we, we've changed the curriculum, but we haven't trained the teachers. Mm. We don't have, and, and last, in the last budget, last year, when our AI review was put into the budget, um, uh, we got the money for the AI review and the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation that the government have also set up. Um, they've put in money, a, bil a million pounds I think it was, to train computer science teachers um, so that we can get the right uh, education in the schools, so that we can encourage people to, to, to um, more people to learn mm. these skills. But I also, um, I think we, it's about time we um, stopped accepting it when people say that, oh, I can't do mathematics and accepting that that's okay. Um, and I think AI can help us here. I would give the example where I um, was very, I was naturally good at mathematics at school and by the time I was, well, in primary school, I was being asked to teach the other kids math because it just mm. came so naturally to me and I, I couldn't understand why other people couldn't do it. And then much later in life, I started to try and learn to ski, and I was hopeless at skiing, <laughs> absolutely hopeless. And I used to fall over on the nursery slopes, I couldn't get up, and the instructors eventually get bored with picking you up, and <laughs> everyone else moved on to the higher slopes, and I went to the bar. <laughs> what I needed was a personal coach. I needed someone to help yeah, me yeah. get the confidence, and, and that's what we, and I think we can use AI to develop um, personal tutors and coaches for, for kids. I think we need, um, we need, we do need more people with maths and stat skills, uh, but we need the all-round skills as well. It's not that everyone's got to become a mathematician and a computer programmer. And do you think I mean, Eva's point about teaching uh, um, adults, you know, c c constantly learning, are we going to move into a world where you don't qualify whether you do apprenticeship or go to university or whatever, uh, and you become you know, some expert in a particular job or career, and you see that through to the end of your life. We, we will have we'll to be constantly, because you know, if AI is constantly catching up with us, we're going to have to well, I think keep we're retraining and we're learning. We're already seeing that. Today's, uh, the millennials, whatever, today's kids will not have the same expectations of jobs that, well, I'm older than you, but you and I, Jim, might have had that you had your job for, for life. And, and uh, yeah. so we're already into that we're world. We're academics, so we obviously we have a job for life. That's what we do. We just never well, this leave. Is, this is true. <laughs> but will, the act will there be academics? I don't know. But the, um, I, think that, uh, I think we can use AI to help with education. I, I firmly believe that we can to help people get uh, develop skills throughout their life. Uh, Neil. Andy has asked, how can we ensure that the benefits of AI are shared outside of London? <laughs> <laughs> that may resonate here, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I've spent f 15 years living in Sheffield, but five years commuting to Manchester, working here. Um, we have a lot of problems with the London-centricness of the country today. It certainly wasn't historically the case. There's this weird thing that if you look at where all the innovation came from, it came from the north, and when everyone got rich enough, they all moved south. There's this sort of common pattern. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the family in Glossop that founded the mills there, but uh, the Hillwoods, you know, and they ended up running Arsenal. How'd that happen? <laughs> um, we, we, I think we're starting, I, I, there's no simple answer to this question. And actually, Wendy's sort of saying, I, I don't fully agree that China and the US are uh, 
so world leading ahead of us. I mean, and I think that that victim culture is, is really something we have to watch. Like if Manchester's going to look and say, oh, there's things being done to us all the time and, 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 and it's out of our control. Well, that won't work. We have to stand up and say, no, we can affect things. We can change things. And Manchester's in a great position on that in terms of the devolution deal, which my understanding of which is uh, devolved health carers alongside social care. Um, there's devolved transport here. Um, it is very hard to do changes, uh, good changes, um, to, uh, on a national scale. Um, you need regions that can try these things. Edinburgh has a lot of things going on um, in health. Uh, because Scotland, uh, which is only the same population as Yorkshire, uh, can trial a lot of these things. The Manchester City region um, uh, can trial these things uh, that can't just be spun up in London. Um, the Royal Society should come and do events here. Um, <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> all, all of these things help. In fact, um, you know, you know I, I do really worry that you know, we should not be reactive, we should be proactive. And, I, I'm, and that's maybe easy to say, but it's not going to happen if we're just saying, oh, people are doing things to us. And Manchester's the leading university. One of my uh, great friends and colleagues here, Magnus Rattre, runs the uh, Data Science Institute here. He's a top academic individual, um, and it's an amazing institute. And data science is just AI without the hype. Um, you know, so it really, the seeds are there. Um, one problem is, I don't think we've, we, you know, there's been this tradition that we have to cut costs everywhere, and that's closed down the room for innovation. So how do we recover that innovative culture um, that says, that the, for everyone, whatever their job, whether it's doctor, social care work, or whatever, that says, there is room for me to innovate in my job and make things better? Because I think that's one major problem we have. When you speak to people, who are doing these important jobs on the ground where we could get a lot of benefit by introducing these technologies, they just don't have the time. They're so busy with what they're doing. And, and, and that, as well as the training, it's great they can go and get training, but in, the innovative ones have it knocked out of them. And, and that really worries me. Um, I don't know how we change that. I mean, I guess big cities like Manchester are, are well-placed to be able to make sure they're not left behind. But let's say outside of London and Manchester and the big regional, you know, the big cities, there must be whole areas of society who are going to feel disenfranchised or are going to feel more threatened by automation. Absolutely. Just look at the places that feel most upset with the current status quo. So my son used to play football in Sheffield and we were going out east all the time to old mining villages where the football clubs are still associated with the miners' welfare clubs, right? Mm -hmm. and, but the mine doesn't exist. You know, they took their kids' football a lot more seriously than I took my kids' football because that's a major thing going on in the community. Um, and what we've seen is that there wasn't a massive conversation about how we shut the mines down and everything else. Ironically, like we're now having now, I mean, we talk about accountants, but there weren't thousands of accountants on the street. When stockbroking disappeared as a job, that, there weren't thousands of mm, those out exactly. on the street. Um, but we did just put these people out of work and massively disenfranchise them. And that is not clear to me at all how we put that right. Because it's not like, you know, there's nice things that, so I was at a meeting where Jeffrey Sachs said, it's going to be great, we can just discuss philosophy in coffee shops. And I, <laughs> I sort of said, well, that is great. But around those communities, there were a lot of things, you know, there was a social structure associated with hard work, which was a very important part of the community. And that kind of went when the work changed. Um, it's, it's to me that, that this goes beyond uh, AI, um, and, and I don't think we're talking about it enough. I think, you know, you, I, I've sat in policy meetings where you realize we're talking about, oh, what's going to happen when, when sort of, you know, in the future doctors are cha have their work changed, or lawyers, or accountants. Well, in the past, they were fine because they've all got an old boy network and they moved on to something else and they were educated. But the people who are at the most marginalized section of society, like driving taxis now, I met a guy once who um, went into catering, became a prison chef in Lancaster. They closed Lancaster prison. Um, his only option was to drive taxis. He was very happy driving taxis. So what if, if that goes? You know, this is, this is very, very challenging. And I don't think AI is bringing the answers, it may bring uh, more problems. Can I, can I yes, say something yes, there? I think the, one of the things for me is how much local government can use AI to make services more efficient. And I think we talk about, we talk very glibly about smart cities, 
But I think it's actually to best easier and more beneficial initially to create a smart village uh, because you can, you can actually tackle that issue. Um, and, I, and, and when you think of what the local governments are being asked to do today in terms of the cuts in, in mm. and, the, and the huge... I mean, we had an email yesterday from Southampton City Council. I don't live in... But I live in the New Forest, but I saw the email about how they've got to make these huge cuts and they've got to decide what to cut and we're asking the people what would you do now and and it's that well really the benefits for AI in those situations um, I think that's where we should be putting the effort and that's how you get it outside London because actually the big metropolises like London Manchester Edinburgh are much harder to make smart because they're just that much bigger and they're much less homogeneous. So I think there's a huge thing about local community. The other thing I would, um, why I think the US and China have the, apart from the scale of the number of people working in the area, they have huge amounts of data. That's where China gets its power from. But there are the things area. like the UK, so it's all very well saying, oh, there's these big companies. What is the budget of the NHS? 400 billion. That is larger than the turnover of the largest company in the world. Right, 400 billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. I and, 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 and rather than sort of saying, oh, look at that, they've got all that. No, we yeah, have a say, national health we're system. Saying that. With, we're saying that. We say that, but we need to do more about it. And think one problem with it is as we operate that, we are constantly so obsessed with efficiency around it that we don't look for the opportunities mm. to innovate and well, use and, and save, save money the there. The current health minister for. was the person who drove the AI review. So there is some hope if they last at all as a government. Um, <laughs> but it comes back, the problem with the, uh, 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 the national health is a jewel in our crown in terms of an asset we can use to mine the data to give them better personal uh, care, medicine. Mm. But you've got the huge ethical issues mm. of how you, who deals with the data and how you deal with it. Mm. And I think you'll do it at a local level. That's the point I was trying to make there. And it's about scale, really. That's why... Yeah, I want, I want to stick with you, Wendy, for this next question. Uh, Zygmunt asks, do we need to be educating politicians or, or on just what is possible with enough data to ensure that the privacy debate is well, well-founded? That picks up very well. I don't know if you planned this, but it picks well, up very well on what we, just to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, what we were talking about. I think the interesting thing for politicians is they are already well aware of the issues because most politicians, the most important thing to them is the next election. And one of the things that's happening with AI is threatening democracy in terms of... Uh, you know, the whole, all the issues around um, the social networks and uh, what uh, the companies like Cambridge Analytica, who have now disappeared completely, but there are other people with those skills, can do to try and manipulate the way that we vote. What the Russians are doing and other countries, the Iran and, and other countries like that are doing to try and uh, get, you know, d not destroy democracy, but certainly to tamper with it. Mm. Um, and I think this is a major threat for us. And I will bring China back in again because there's no, there's not, that's not a democratic and never has been country. Um, they have a completely different view on, uh, on all this. Um, and, I, and I think our politicians are quite aware of that because they are worried about the next election um, that, because that's uh, what they're all about. So I think they are... Um, I, and in terms of educating them, though, there have been these great reports that have come out. And um, uh, I think that um, uh, th the problem we have is that... Mo I, I mentioned Matt Hancock, who's just gone to health... Um, and he actually is someone who understands programming. He can, he can program, right? There's mm. very few politicians who are at all science or engineering mm. literate. And I think that's a worry. And I think that's a worry. Not that we're going to make all our politicians scientists or engineers, but that scientists and engineers are not going into, into politics. politics yeah. Yeah. I think that's the biggest problem we've got. Mm. Okay, question, how are we doing for time? We're doing fine for time. Okay, Abby asks, if algorithms are dependent on using our data, should we be paid for it? Oh, Ever. What do you think? It's our so data. Contentious. <laughs> you want to use data? information about me? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, so, so 
some people would say that we are being paid for it via the services. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. But, um, you know, so, for example, you're using Facebook for free. And how is it free? It's free because it has a monetization model that relies on the social graph, sells that, that data on to advertisers who then push products at you. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. so that's one model potentially. So arguably we're being paid through service. But, um, you know, the other idea that uh, somehow, you know, we can, we can harness or harvest all of our data and then sell it off um, through some kind of sort of, you know, horizontal market mm -hmm. is, um, is something that people, I, I guess, especially in the academic sphere, people have been talking about for a little while. Mm -hmm. So there's a few projects that are sort of dealing with this. One of them is a hub of all things, and that was initially intended to be, I think it's more of a privacy-focused thing now, but it was an initially intended to be um, a, um, a, a platform that um, kept your data safe and then you could decide which of that data to sell on to which companies in return for some kind of service or money or whatever. Now in theory that's a really good idea because you think well it makes total sense right my data I get money for it you know great but there's a couple of problems with that one is that you know um, the implications for exposing your data about any activities in your life is that there's a re concurrent reduction in privacy now you might be cool with that but actually who are the people that are going to be selling their data it's not somebody who earns 150,000 pounds a year it's somebody potentially who's either on benefits or on low income and they'll think 50 pounds actually is worth it for that bit of information but we don't know what the long-term effects are of mm. exposing our data in that way so in reality whilst it seems very simple as a sort of a proposition it's massively problematic in terms of what that would mean for people being sort of marginalized and you know ultimately potentially exploited so um, I mean I think there is a question that needs to be addressed you know are we being exploited is our data being used in ways that um, it shouldn't be but I'm not sure that um, you know getting money for it solves that problem mm. it almost causes more problems because it's like it finishes the conversation it's like you've given me your you've data been I've paid been for it I now can exactly. use it in any way I like right yeah. so you're yeah. not really engaging in a meaningful debate yeah. about it yeah. then so so um, you know I, I think on the face of it it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea but actually in reality more complicated we've come to the last question and this is a question from Fozzie Foz <laughs> and there's some great names by the way fantastic <laughs> thank you all uh, Fozzie asks at what point will we be able to say that machine learning has become machine understanding? That's a great question to end with. Neil. So um, we talked a little bit about empathy earlier and machines having empathy. And um, uh, what, what's interesting about this is if we were machines, if we were in the future when this debate is being had by machines, uh, <laughs> no, <Yes. laughs> that's a job. The debate wouldn't actually happen because Hardly we would no. just communicate over Wi-Fi to each other everything we thought, agree on an algorithm, and In you would be done. Right. <laughs> because we are the most. The reason why AGI won't happen, and I totally disagree with what Wendy said, is because <laughs> we are a function of our limitations, not the technology. We're a function of our limited ability to communicate. So I can only communicate at 100 bits per second. I don't know what these little guys are doing here, but the capability of a computer is to do billions of bits per second. As a result, what we spend most of our do time doing is thinking about other people, worrying about other people. What did that look mean? Oh, look at that grumpy person there. Oh, this person's mm -hmm. in a bad mood this morning, blah, blah, blah. Because we can't actually directly communicate what's going on. And that's why we need empathy, and, and that's why we're so cool. I mean, we've got massive computational ability, but limited ability to express ourselves. And that's why all we have all these drives and senses. But the computers we, we build will never have that, because they can just communicate intent immediately across themselves. But the problem is at the interface, right? So you can build a system of efficient computers that could run our economy and everything else way better than we could do it. And if you leave humans out of the loop, that'd be fine. But what's the point? What are they actually doing it for? At the end of the day, this is about humans. I despise the idea of transhumanism because the real idea is about us you know, and what we want out of things. There, there isn't anything else. Um, and that's where the challenge is, that we have this limited bandwidth of communication. We all hopefully understand each other. Most of the problems are when we don't across cultures and whatever else. Um, and unless we get the machines to sort of have some sense of that and what we really mean, we will never get machine understanding. There's a possibility we can emulate it, you know, after with a lot of data, well, I think there's a strong possibility. I think one day we'll be able to emulate it. And I think that as we get closer to it, 
Um, that's when we'll feel more comfortable with our computers, do the things that Wendy talked about of the personal coach, you know, and, and reflect the various different ethics in our computational systems. But you know, it, it's, a, it's a long way off, but I, I think that's, it's a great question, and, and, and that should be mm. the route. Ever, what do you think, machine learning? Well, machine I would have gone with the empathy thing as well, but he's answered that now. So I'm going to go a different route, which is um, about you know, uh, flipping it around a little bit to say that um, it's also about humans understanding machines. So, um, you know, we might reach uh, ma machine understanding where a machine understands everything that's going on with a human being, but we also have to um, have some kind of, I guess, like symbiotic relationship almost, where the humans understand the machines as well. And that involves a greater focus on the things that we're already starting to look at. So transparency, um, how does how has that res um, machine reached its judgment? Why has it done that? Why that and not something else? All of those things that we just can't answer. And actually with the more um, complicated um, algorithms, so neural networks, and such like, we, we, even a trained expert is going to struggle to tell you how it reached its judgment. So for us to be able to understand the system, there's a lot of work that's got to go into that. And also the interface design as well. So these things at the moment, um, a lot of the IoT, um, you know, the Internet of Things technology is designed so that it's um, invisible in use. It sweats, uh, frees us up, sorry, from sweating the small stuff and we can go off and do crazy things with our lives. But actually, um, while we carry on doing that, we become more and more dislocated from what is actually happening and how we're being, if you like, enslaved or controlled or manipulated. So I think it's bi-directional. You know, the machine must understand, but also we must understand the machine. Wendy. Hmm. There's so many things here. Um, uh, I think the next wave of innovation is going to come around intention, and I think... You said that, did Neil mentioned this earlier, I can't remember if it was Neil or either. We have in the labs already uh, the brain-machine interfaces. Mm. Right. I think this is where the next wave of innovation is going to come from, the fact that machines will be able to read our thoughts or at least read our brain waves and interpret that. I, I was inspired a bit by what you said, Neil, on this. And it comes back again to uh, your point about it, it's the augmentation between humans and machines that's going to be so interesting. And this, again, uh, I'm getting a bit in, quite interested in the whole smart city concept here because, um, you know, we're very glibly talking about smart cities, but if we wanted to have, you know, um, an AI controlling the temperature in this room, how would it decide what to do with all of us sitting here? Right? It's hard enough with one person to decide what temperature it's going to be when you walk in with. What's our intentions? Half, you know, we'd all want different, different environments, different temperatures, and I think um, so. The, I, I, the, I think this is where um, where it's going. I think the other thing I, I go back in time and think about Alan Turing and his Turing test. Um, to decide whether machines could think. And he was, you know, for a long time, that was the um, holy grail. Could, mm. we, could we get machines that solve the Turing test? And over time, so basically, if you don't know the Turing test, I'm sure most people do. It's like you have a machine and a person behind a screen, and you ask them the same questions, and from their answers, decide which one's the machine and which one's the human. If you can't tell the difference, then that you've got an intelligent machine. Well, you might have a <laughs> dumb human. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And... And this came across when Google recently um, did their, well, I think it was Google, they had uh, something, uh, Alexa or Siri, one of them, ring a restaurant to book a table and to book <laughs> a hairdresser's appointment. And I felt it was very sorry for the human being on the other end um, who was uh, being asked to do something they didn't really understand by something that actually was a bit, lot sharper than them in many ways. And uh, so I, I think this, um, and, and the other thing I, I want to just add to this is that we aren't always as intelligent or as uh, able to communicate as, you know, the people sitting around this room. We start off completely dumb as babies and we learn. And there's a lot of research in, is it e-life and things like that, where you, you, know, you think about how do you grow a machine, and there's been a lot of science fiction about this, that knows nothing and then grows. And I think I like this idea. Um, it came across in the Philip Pullman books about your demon, that when you're born, you have a demon that grows up with you and, and uh, uh, is your coach and uh, you know, your interface to life. And uh, So I, I think there's, there's lots of new, new research areas that will play into this as we go forward. Very exciting. Well, very exciting indeed. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, fantastic debate. On behalf of the Royal Society, 
A huge thanks to our host, the Manchester Science Festival and the Royal Exchange Theatre. Thank you to DeepMind for their kind support of the UNAI series. And I guess perhaps, well obviously thanks to my, my three panellists, but thanks to all of you, our guests, for, for coming here tonight, and especially to those who ask such brilliant questions. So lots and lots of food for thought. The debate carries on. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and we hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you all very much. Good night.